Welcome to Chapter 10, Relationships and Attraction. One of the difficulties in studying human behavior that's particularly salient when studying relationships is that we cannot assign people to experimental conditions. That is, it would be highly unethical and probably practically impossible to assign people to be in relationships with particular other persons. The need for connection with other people appears to be universal. All countries have some form of friendships, marriage, or other kinds of pair bonding, and familial relationships. People who have connections with others tend to be happier, healthier, and live longer. Recent surveys have shown that self-reported anxiety and depression is significantly higher in the United States as a result of the disconnections we are all experiencing due to this pandemic. Interestingly, one of the first studies to demonstrate the need we have for connections was done with monkeys. In the late 1950s, Harry Harlow did a number of studies with baby rhesus monkeys. The monkeys were raised not by their biological mothers, but by two substitute mothers, as pictured here. One of the mothers was covered with a soft towel, as pictured on the left, and the other was simply wire mesh, attached to which was a bottle that fed the baby. When the infant monkeys were frightened, Harlow found that they preferred the contact of the soft or cloth mother as opposed to the one that fed them. He termed this contact comfort. We humans have several different types or kinds of relationships with other people. Margaret Clark and Judson Mills describe these relationships as being of two fundamental types. One is communal relationships in which we feel a special responsibility for one another and have a long-term sense of sharing and responsibility. In exchange relationships, the individuals interact in an economic fashion. That is, each person gives what they get and gets what they give. These relationships do not entail long-term senses of responsibility or caring for others. You can probably think of examples of both of these types of relationships. For example, your family is hopefully a communal relationship, and perhaps your job is more of an exchange relationship. There are a number of theories about how people evaluate the relationships in their lives. For example, social exchange theory suggests that we make a numerical calculation. Am I getting as much out of this as I'm giving? But not just that, we also compare the current relationship to possible alternative relationships. That is, we may not be perfectly satisfied with a current relationship, but feel that we can't find anything better and would rather have a bird in the hand, so to speak. A related idea is equity theory, in which people evaluate relationships in terms of fairness. Are the benefits that I get from this relationship proportional to the effort I put into it. Expanding on Harlow's ideas, the American psychologist Mary Ainsworth developed attachment theory, which is the idea that the attachments we have to our parents or other caregivers early in our lives set the stage for how we relate to interpersonal relationships for the rest of our days. Those early relationships serve as a framework or model for how we believe other people will treat us. 
the experimental setup is pictured in the slide in front of you. In the first slide, a mother takes her infant to an unfamiliar room with interesting toys. While the infant explores the room and plays with the toys, a stranger enters and the mother leaves. Picture B shows the mother returning to the room, picking up and comforting the infant if the infant is upset. And picture C shows the mother again putting the infant down, allowing him or her to play with the toys in the room. Ainsworth noticed three distinct attachment styles. Insecure attachment, which is typical of most infants. The child is somewhat upset when the mother leaves, but easily comforted when she returns. In the avoidance style, the infant does not particularly pay attention to the mother's presence and neither protests when she leaves nor is excited when she returns. And in the anxious ambivalent style, the infant is very clingy with the mother, very upset when she leaves, and when she returns, both runs to her for comfort and is angry with her and pushes her away. What's interesting is that the attachment style one has as an infant is a good predictor of the kind of attachment style one has with romantic partners as an adult. People with secure attachment styles don't worry about being abandoned or about someone getting too close. That is, they find the relationship safe and secure. People with an avoidant attachment style have a difficult time trusting people and tend not to let others get too emotionally close to them. Finally, those with an anxious ambivalent style are very worried about being abandoned and their intense attachment to their partners often frighten the partners and drive them away which only reinforces the anxiety that the person had beforehand. What is it that determines whether or not we'll like somebody? How about whether or not we'll find them attractive? One factor that seems important is proximity, that is, we tend to like people more when we see them more often. That is, if we're around them, if they are physically close, then we're more likely to like them. This figure is adapted from a 1950 study on friendships that were formed in married student housing. As you can see, the more contact people had with their neighbors, the more likely they were to form friendships with them. Part of this may have to do with the mere exposure effect. That is, the more familiar we are with something, that is, the more exposure we have to it, the more we tend to like it. When it comes to beliefs and personality, birds of a feather flock together more so than opposites attract. Romantic couples are much more likely to be similar on these traits than they are to be different. Even in cases where partners may seem like opposites in some domains, they are much more likely to have overall similarities than differences. Physical attractiveness, not surprisingly, plays an important role in who we are emotionally and intimately attracted to. There is a good deal of variability in terms of what people find attractive, but there are certainly some common features. Fortunately, liking someone makes them more attractive to us. And so these measures of attractiveness are not stable, but depend on the intimate or emotional connection we have to the people. Surprise, attractive people get more dates than people who are less attractive. There is also a halo effect. 
going back to the ancient Greeks who believed that which beautiful is good, we tend to assume that attractive people are happier, more likable, nicer, more intelligent, etc. It turns out, however, that there is no basis for these expectations. To some extent, there are some universals in what people consider attractive. But again, there is a great deal of individual and cultural variability. Our beliefs about what is attractive have changed over time. From left to right, these images of attractive people are from 1876, 1919, 1950, and the 2000s. One theory about what people find attractive has to do with evolution. That is, those physical manifestations of health and fertility tend to be the same traits that people find attractive in a partner or a potential partner. Both averageness and bilateral symmetry have been identified as characteristics that people find attractive in others. We see here a number of faces that have been averaged together, and people tend to find the face on the bottom right to be more attractive than any of the other faces in the composite. Not that averageness is the most attractive feature, but the average of all the faces tends to be rated as more attractive than any of the other faces that were combined to make that average. This may have to do with bilateral symmetry. That is, any deviations from perfect symmetry in any of the individual faces will be averaged out when they are combined into a composite. And we do know that symmetry from left to right tends to be a cue of health. One other prediction from evolutionary theory is that males and females will tend to seek out different characteristics in potential mates. The idea here is that men will be less selective in choosing potential mates because they have the biological capacity to produce many children in a short period of time. Women, on the other hand, will tend to be more selective because it takes them far more time and energy to develop a new human being. In many human societies, women tend to prefer men who have resources of some kind that can be useful in supporting a potential family. Men are more likely to be attracted to women who are younger because they can potentially have more children. Now this is just one theory. There are many other reasons why males and females may have different preferences in potential partners. For example, social factors have a huge impact. Throughout history, males have had far more control over resources in many societies. In fact, in cultures where there's greater gender equality, women are less interested in a man's status and resources because those resources are more fairly distributed throughout the culture. In the United States, approximately 2.3 million couples get married each year. And in this society, we tend to see romantic love as a basis for marriage. This is not true everywhere in the world, or even in our own societies across time. The notion of romantic love as a basis for marriage is largely a phenomenon in Western cultures and in modern Western cultures. Historically, marriage was seen as a way to combine the resources of two families in order to survive. Romantic love is not the only kind of love. For example, companionate love is the love we have for our friends and family. We trust them, we like to be around them, we share things with them. 
compassionate love is the love of a parent for a child. It's focusing on taking care of that other person's needs. Romantic love is what we mean by saying we're in love. There's intense emotional attachment. This is sometimes called passionate love. Just remember that if you're tempted to run off to Las Vegas to get married one weekend with a total stranger, that what happens in Vegas ends up on YouTube. One model that predicts people's likelihood of staying in a relationship is the investment model. There are three determinants that make partners more committed to the relationship. One is satisfaction. Are the rewards more than the cost in the relationship? Two is particular alternatives. If there's not a better alternative, we're more likely to stay in the current relationship. And three, you might refer to as the sunk cost investments in the relationship. The more people have invested in a relationship in terms of time and commitment, the more likely they are to stay committed. It's fairly common knowledge that approximately one half of marriages end in divorce. The question is, why is this? One theory from a 2015 study is that people expect much more from their marriages than they did 30 or 40 years ago. Unlike in past decades, the average American now expects their marriage to fulfill love, belonging, self-esteem, self-expression, and personal growth needs. That is, they expect their spouse to help them reach the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Consequently, people are less satisfied on average with their marriages today because of the increased expectations of their partners. There are some statistical predictors of divorce, but please bear in mind that these are average predictors and don't necessarily mean anything about your personal relationship. On average, people who have higher levels of neuroticism, who are very sensitive to rejection, who get married at a young age, and who have financial difficulties are more likely to get divorced on average than people at the other ends of those continua. Finally, four types of behaviors have been identified as significant predictors of trouble in a relationship. Being overly critical, refusing to accept responsibility, emotional withdrawal, and particularly contempt are red flags for trouble in the relationship. I hope that you've enjoyed this trip through chapter 10, and I look forward to seeing you all next week.